Before we start today's show, let me tell you the podcast is brought to you every single day by the Oxford Exxon Highway 6 West in Oxford. Go ahead and get a lunch special with the cooler temperatures, the rain in the uh, forecast for the weekend. Brunswick Stew, your lunch special today, four ninety nine, two sides bread, 32-ounce drink there at the Oxford Exxon. Also, you get clean convenience store, great gas prices, the mobile rewards app, and much more when you're coming into town for Ole Miss and Arkansas tomorrow. Take advantage when you're on Highway 6 West, and maybe you're driving in in a Clark Ford. Clark Ford's on Highway 25 South there in Amory. Give them a call at 662-257-1900. Ask for Corey Clark. Within 15 minutes, you get a quote within business hours. Shop it around. Take it. It's going to be the best deal at the end of the that negotiation when you're signing the contract $500 off your vehicle there with Clark Ford just by mentioning the podcast this one or any of the MPW digital family of podcasts now on with the show from the Clark Ford studio in Oxford Mississippi MBW digital proudly presents the Oxford Exxon podcast I'd say thanks for tuning in but why am I going to give you a round of applause for something you're supposed to do to be frank and now here are your hosts Chase Parm. And broadcast school has really paid off. And Neil McCrady. I deserve to be on TV. Welcome to this Friday, Oxford Exxon podcast. I am in Oxford, Clark Ford Studios. Neil is in Chicago, Illinois, taking a uh, trip with Carson. We'll get to uh, some basketball today. We'll visit with Jeffrey Wright. I recorded that interview on Thursday morning, so I I don't think anything's time sensitive, but should it be, just know that that interview happened around 8 a.m., about 24 hours ago from when we are recording right now, so that is where we are at. Mr. McCready, has anyone uh, threatened members of ownership yet, or how are things going there uh, in, uh, in the Windy City? No, the thing starts this ap- this afternoon. Um, and ownership, actually, normally when they get this thing, the ownership has their a panel that's just for them, where they take questions from fans and, um, you know, a lot of fans in person. Um, in in this case, they canceled it. Oh, they good. Claimed that the, uh, they claimed that the feedback said that they were boring. <laughs> um, basically, look, it, it, it goes beyond. And we're not making this a Cubs podcast because nobody cares. But it, it, I think Cubs fans are are angry about something beyond just. So Bryce Harper and Manny Machado are on the market. They're 26 years old, generational talents, in the middle of a uh, very competitive window when you have this core group of of young stars in their 20s. Not only are you not involved with either of them, you're bullpen which is the reason that you, you you didn't go further in the postseason than you did last year has holes all in it and you're not even sniffing on you know adequate but helpful relievers who've been out in the free agent market and then on top of that you're raising ticket prices you're creating all these different revenue streams you're about to start your own network which is going to cost people more money um, I, I think it's one of those things where people just sort of want an answer, they don't get it. And we, you know, you've seen this with, with Ole Miss when people feel like they're not getting an, an, a proper answer from the administration, they get angrier. Um, I, I think I think transparency is always a good thing when it comes to stuff like this. And when when people, as people get less transparent, people get testy, and when people get testy, it it often turns into something that it that it, that it really isn't, if that makes sense. And I think that's where it is with with the Cubs fans. They they've been to the postseason the last four years. They've got this young core of players. Um, they've they've got um, they but they're in a very competitive division with with um, the Brewers who have a, a, an excellent team. The Cardinals have improved themselves. The Reds have improved themselves. People who watch a lot of baseball know that the Pirates aren't that far away from being a, a competitive team and. I think they look at it and say, why are the Cubs not trying to get better? And they don't get answers. And when they don't get answers, they get testy. That's fair. I'm just kind of curious. Also, this is not going to be anywhere near a political podcast today, but how are, uh, how are airports yesterday just with all the TSA stuff? Well, Memphis is... Uh, oh, Memphis never mind. I see it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Memphis was busier than usual. What's interesting is we flew into Midway, and we got to Midway at 
it's like 7 30 in the morning and um the line to get into flights at midway yesterday was not bad at all it appeared to be uh moving pretty quickly so knock on wood i'm, I'm hoping that we don't have major problems sunday afternoon trying to get back but um i got i overheard some kind of tsa people saying that it's bad some places and not so bad in other places so maybe, maybe we're in a couple places that weren't bad memphis is just Memphis was busier than usual, and so the line was a little longer than usual, but it wasn't a big deal. The Super Bowl in Atlanta, should this thing stretch out? I, I can't imagine what Hartsfield-Jackson would be like. Well, they'll have to figure it out. They'll have to bring in extra people. They'll have to bring in people from other places or stuff like that. They, they're, but, you know, there's a tendency in some of these places, and I don't know whether Hartsfield is or is not one of those, to say, well, it is what it is. I don't think you can do that next week with the Super Bowl. If I were the people in Atlanta, I would be far more concerned about logistics than I was who's playing. Oh, yeah, that's what I meant. I meant just people yeah. and whatever. Uh, but That's why I don't think some yeah. of the – when they're trying to be cute about go Rams and stuff like that, it, I don't know. I, I know they're just, they're just having some fun, but it, I don't think it's the best PR look in the world. Just shut up and make sure everything's – ready to go because you're about a week away from just so yes it's like a, a multi-corporate convention is what the super bowl is and when all those people converge on on your city for the better part of a week to entertain clients and stuff you better be able to get them in and out of the airport and and, and things of that, that nature you better start off on the right foot you don't you don't want to uh hang yourself traveling one of the uh one of the benefits of, of blue delta is you probably could just like a carry on you didn't have to check anything did you well we just combined our stuff so we did check oh, a bag really? i'm in the, i'm in the vast minority of people i have i have absolutely no problem checking a bag it doesn't bother me and two the people that cram big suitcases into overheads drive me insane so i i, I rarely check a bag you mean you rarely my brother and i on. thought about that I, yeah, I rarely carry on. I usually just check my bag. Well, if you have a small carry on, it is convenient. very easy just to carry on. It is, but you know, I mean, if I'm going someplace just for a quick weekend, I might do a carry on, but I'll frequently check that bag too. I don't want to have to haul it around the airport. Hmm. Fair enough. You, uh, I'm in the minority on that. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I get it though. I, I typically will check. It does not. I, I am not now part of this because I've had good luck with this. I'm not terrified of them losing my bag. That doesn't really enter my mind most of the time. So that is. Uh, I've had my bag quote lost. My bag has been quote lost in quote twice in my career, and in both occasions it was inconvenient. But in both occasions they got it to me within a few hours. Well, even uh, though you had to do the worst that happened, I was, I was in New Orleans. I was in New Orleans, and my bag somehow ended up in Minneapolis. But they flew it to New Orleans on the next flight and delivered it to my hotel. I mean, I had it eight hours later. Well, that's not bad. It wasn't terrible. It really wasn't. I mean, it was inconvenient, but it wasn't the end of the world. And I knew all along there. Oh, we found it. We know where it is. And they, we communicated. And then the other time, it was just. I think I was. I can't remember where I was, but. Atlanta, maybe, and it got on the wrong flight, but they got it to me. I had it within two or three hours. Yeah. Well, you uh, you had a little more pleasant day than me yesterday. We've only exchanged a couple texts about this. So <clears throat> yesterday morning, uh, I, I don't really know what's going on with me. I I'd had some uh, I'd had some stomach pain for the last forty eight hours or so, where I would be fine. Like I would feel a hundred percent, and every half hour or so, I would have this really sharp pain for 90 seconds to two minutes started sometime late tuesday afternoon went even when i went to the basketball game on tuesday night i was kind of experiencing it a little bit went into wednesday and then yesterday i thought this is probably kind of strange let me just go get checked out so i go to the doctor and within 10 minutes they're giving me a an abdominal x-ray all this stuff they're getting blood work i've got a fever i've got an elevated white blood count um they don't know what's going on. Ended up with a CT yesterday afternoon. And I'm thinking, who knows? This is whatever. And then at first I thought, well, this is great news. And then the more I hear from people, because I've never experienced it before, they tell me I have a kidney stone. And 
I don't necessarily think I'm that close to passing and I think I'm still very early on in the uh, in the process of this things and since then all I have gotten Neil is horror stories about how bad this is going to be as it progresses yeah I don't knock on wood know much about this I, I have no experience whatsoever with uh, with kidney stones I've heard horror stories I, I, I wish you the very best but I, I do have some fears for you because I think I think sometimes it goes okay, and I think sometimes it's a nightmare for people. They told me this morning to get, that they would call me in some flow max to try to widen everything up and give me a chance to pass it on my own. And then if I can't, they said, well, obviously, urology appointment and whatnot. And they were like, well, we can give you some pain pills. And I've had multiple buddies go, yeah, take go ahead and get those just in case. You're, you're, you're probably going to need them. Um, I've been told everything from drink beer to make you uh, urinate more to up and down the the, the, the spectrum of, of, of self-help advice I've been given by some, some friends and different people. Um, it is my advice kind of throughout life that when in doubt, just drink a beer. Yeah, so yeah. I would, I would drink a beer. Yeah. Just drink a beer. That might be the answer to, uh, to all of this, but nonetheless, I, I think I have some unpleasantness coming at, uh, at some point. I, when I, when I woke up yesterday morning, I did not think, well, you'll be doing x-rays and CTs at some point, uh, throughout the next 12 hours, but I mean, it was better. It was better than appendicitis or something. I didn't need to go into surgery yesterday or anything, so I'll be all right. Um, but and had you done, had you gone to WebMD and looked it up, you would have thought you had body cancer. Yeah, had, the, the, my entire abdomen would have been cancerous. Everything would have been malignant. Yeah, you have, a day, you have a day to live. <laughs> so yeah. uh, I, I I would like for it to be over quicker. It's still hurting this morning, but again, it's just periodic. It's the strangest thing. You'll feel fine, and then just bam. They say it's when it's moving. Um, they're this was just speculation, but one of the people at the at the doctor's office today thought that maybe um, I drink a lot of Powerade Zero, and they thought that maybe there was a chemical in that or whatever that was causing it that, that increased the chances of uh, kidney stones, that any type of sports drink has phosphate, I think is what it is, that, uh, that increases that. So I think it's a soft drink thing, too, but I don't really drink soft drinks much, but I do drink a lot of Powerade Zero, so. Anyway, I was gonna say I don't ever really see you drink soft drinks. No, I don't really drink soft drinks, but I will. Uh, I, I'll have on a day that I work out, I'll drink a thirty-two ounce Powerade Zero. So I mean, four to five days a week, potentially, I'm drinking one of those. I mean, that's that's a good bit of sports drink over a week. Uh, we'll get into Ole Miss a little bit. That's our personal lives for the uh, for the day. We'll go to Jeffrey in about ten minutes or so. Ole Miss in Arkansas tomorrow noon on uh, what's the channel? No, I don't even know. It's a SEC network. Uh, Sorry, I have your It's SEC network at noon. SEC network. Yes. Ole Miss thirteen and three, three and one in the SEC. Arkansas ten and six, one and three in the SEC. Kind of critical time there for the Razorbacks, but critical time for the Rebels too, to uh, keep hold of that early margin they got with their big wins, especially on the road at Vanderbilt and Mississippi State. And then uh, some not so good news coming out of Oxford yesterday. Devontae Shuler dealing with a stress reaction in that foot. That's what has been uh, feared since he's been in a boot all week. Sounds like he's going to try to go, but ha nobody really knows what the uh, the competency level of that foot will be for uh, Schuler tomorrow. Yeah, the problem for a, a guy like uh, Devontae in this case is that so much of basketball is about chem chemistry, repetition, comfort. When you can't practice, it's just hard to maintain those things. And then so much about basketball is about conditioning. And, you know, it's kind of like, he, he he doesn't he doesn't get that basketball conditioning. The way you play basketball is to run up and down floors, to accelerate and cut and do all the things that you have to do to play basketball. He's not able to do that every day in practice, so he is going to lose some of his conditioning. And then his foot hurts. And if you've ever had a foot that hurts, and I have, I can speak to this. It's a mental thing. It's one thing to say, well, just tough it out. That's all fine and dandy, but you're jumping and cutting, and like the other day, he made a he made a three pointer and started accelerating backwards, and it caught him. I told you, I thought he had, uh, I thought he had lost his shoe, or his shoe had partially come off, and it was his foot. It, it just that pain gets into your mind, stops you from being as effective as you would be if you're playing uh, pain free or if you're playing just kind of free and loose. He's he's not going to be able to do that. They need him badly. He's as important as any player on that team. 
maybe mo- more, more important than even some of the stars on that team because of his ability to run the point, his ability to allow Bree and Tyree to play off the ball. They lost Franco Miller before the season, really. He's not he's not going to play this year. Um, they're really thin at this spot. It, 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 it can't afford this situation to linger. And I've, I've read about stress reactions. They are nothing but a precursor to a stress fracture. This is this is potentially a, a wet blanket on a basketball season. T- to be perfectly honest, there's there's no reason to try to spin this in some positive way. This is um, it is potentially a giant negative. It is it is it is potentially a, a disastrous development um, because at some point they're going to have to make a decision about whether or not to sit him. And if they sit him, they've got to sit him for a while because that's. It's the only way these things heal, and the season still has two months left in it. So this is this is going to be problematic. And, and people say, well, they can shift things around. There's really nothing they can do that is anywhere close to as effective as having, and I mean anywhere close to as having a healthy uh, Devontae Shuba running the point. There, there's there's there, there is no quick fix. There's there's nobody to bring in off the bench. Um, they'll play DC Davis more minutes, but you have to be very careful playing DC Davis more minutes because he's he's not as ta- he's not as physically talented as the people that he, he's going up against. And it's one thing to to get ask minutes from him against the southeastern Louisianas of the world. It's another thing when you're going up against SEC guards, and he's going to have his hands really full. And he's good for them in brief stretches to allow. Kermit to do some some coaching to use the bench as a as a corrective device but if you're asking DC to go play 10 minutes here to go play eight minutes there to combine to play 19 20 21 minutes in an SEC game I don't I don't think that's a good recipe so I don't know what they're going to do they're going to give it a go um if you're Ole Miss you're just hoping for the best you're you're hoping that that he um can play as effective as possible in those two hours and then get off of it again. And uh, you hope that that the game itself doesn't do damage to it and that you can continue to slowly heal it over the course of the next few weeks, but it's going to be something they're going to have to massage. It, it stops their, uh, I think, I think it stops some of the between games development that this team was starting to enjoy uh, with the fact that they have an excellent, excellent, coach who's very very good in Kermit Davis but it's it's harder to coach something when the player's not on the floor than it is when he's just watching or walking through some of it in a boot but look Devontae's a great kid um he's tough he'll 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 give you all he's got and um, that's all you can really ask for but it's it's going to be something that um is going to hinder their season it, but we knew this would happen you know we talked about this when you would talk about, you know, what's the upside? Well, the upside is that this team has a chance to be really good. What's the downside? This team is super thin, and adversity usually hits every team. And so here's this big dose of adversity for this team, and God knows they can't handle any more. I mean, like, they can't have Terrence Davis or um, Brian Tyree or Blake Kenson suffer a, a severe ankle sprain right now they, they 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 don't have the depth to overcome that um two of the juco kids they brought in frankly have been misses so far curry's redshirted um we talked about dc who, who's given them far more than anyone ever would have thought he would have given them but he's he's not ready to be a 25 minute sec guard um they they they're having to try to you know, fill two low post places with three guys, Olenichik and and um, Buffin and and um, um, and, and Bruce. Yeah, they, they're not getting much out of Rodriguez really consistently. I mean, this is a super thin team, and there's no there's no answer. Someone said, "Well, what else could they do?" And I said, "Well, there is nothing else. That's it. That's what they are." So they're gonna have their they're gonna have their hands full, and this this is a they're playing an Arkansas team tomorrow that uh, desperately, and I do mean desperately, needs a win. At, at one and three in the league and, and some rumblings up there that 
Mike Anderson might not be safe if this is a bad season. They they desperately need a win. They'll show up. They'll show up searching for a win uh, tomorrow at noon. No question. Yeah, we'll talk a bit, get a bit of Arkansas later in the show. I did a uh, a radio spot in Fort Smith earlier this morning. I'll get into that a little bit. We're gonna call it Jeffrey too before we go to Jeffrey on the Patterson Nerhard Hotline. We'll tell you about scripted jewelry. Go to the website scriptedjewelry.com. See all the different items that you can customize, you can personalize, and get turnaround quickly. And it's also time to tell you about some holiday cutoffs they have coming up. It's great Valentine's Day gifts, but to take advantage of that. The without rush upgrade cutoff, January 30th. Got to get that thing in by January 30th if you don't want to pay a little more to get it rushed. If you do want uh, or need to get it rushed, February 6th is your cutoff for that. So January 30th, February 6th, the two cutoffs to use Scripted Jewelry. Again, that's scriptedjewelry.com. Uh, Jeffrey Wright and other guests will join us on the Patterson and Earhart Hotline. Patterson and Earhart Attorneys at Law Specialized. Some personal injury law, real estate law, but theirs is a general practice that can handle any of your legal needs. When you call them, you speak to one of the partners in the firm. That's who handles your case, not some paralegal at a faceless corporate firm. So whether you've been injured in a car wreck or have other legal issues, give them a call, 662-526-1992, or check out their website, pelaws.com. Your initial consultation is free. We're also brought to you by Home Two Suites in Oxford. It's just off Old Taylor Road, about one mile from uh, the Old Miss campus. Uh, the uh, pop-up Oxford's getting started. They're offering a 20% discounted rate the entire week. Call the front desk to receive the discount when booking. It's a pet-friendly hotel. You can bring your uh, pets with you. They have a designated area for walks, complete with a pet station for your convenience. Um, they're going to be opening up their football reservations at the end of the month, so you need to be looking for that on social media. It's a great place to come for uh, – Basketball, baseball, softball, if you're coming to cheer on the Rebels this spring, home to Sweets Oxford is a great place to stay. Um, we've been telling you for a while, you should step into the new year in style. You really need to experience the difference a quality sock makes. It's the first step in dressing for the job you want, not the job you have. Um, I, I wore uh, dead socks yesterday all over Chicago, through an airport, all over Chicago. We walked and walked and walked. Never had to stop, not one time, to stop and pull my uh, socks up. They're fantastic, great quality. Go to deadsoxy.com, enter the code REBELGROVE at checkout. You'll get 25% off all orders, including sale items. Remember, promo code REBELGROVE at checkout for 25% off all orders. And Happy New Year from Dead Soxy. Podcast also brought to you by Pinnacle Trust. On Tuesday, January 29th, Pinnacle Trust will be hosting their annual economic forecast in Jackson, Mississippi, at the Country Club of Jackson. Doors open at 5. The Pinnacle team uh, will be there for cocktails and appetizers. The program opens at 6, uh, ends promptly at 7. Goldman Sachs economist John Towsley will be highlighting the current state of global economy and financial markets. The Pinnacle investment team will cover topics ranging from geopolitical risk to tariff negotiations and the impact on markets, as well as the Federal Reserve. For those unable to attend, the event will be recorded and made available on the Pinnacle Trust website, pintrust.com. That's P-I-N-N trust.com. For reservations, email assistant at pintrust.com or call the office at 601-957-0323. I'll be at Gen M Pharmacy later today taking care of some of my own business, and you can too. They're locally owned and operated and care about the customers. been Oxford's trusted hometown pharmacy for over 40 years and offer many great services such as MedZinc, immunizations, and free delivery to your home or workplace right there on South Lamar Boulevard. And transfer your medications is easy. I've done that as well. You give them a call at 662-236-2222, and they will take care of the rest. Now here's Jeffrey Wright on the Oxford Exxon Podcast. Jeffrey, good morning. We're taping on a Thursday. This will run on the Friday show. Neil currently en route to Chicago for the uh, Cubs convention. And uh, we'll talk a little football today, mostly uh but we'll start with some basketball. You and I were uh, texting a bit during Ole Miss and LSU on Tuesday night. Basically, the uh, Tigers were a lot more talented. They played better. Ole Miss uh, not in that game for much of the second half. Kind of what's been your impressions through the, the last week or so? And then uh, you and I were just talking a second ago. You think that the uh, the race for this thing includes eight or nine more wins? Yeah, I mean, if you just look at it from a metric standpoint, if – it's not saying they can't get into the tournament if they 
if they go nine and nine or ten and eight. I'm just saying, if you look at it from a metric standpoint, for them to not have to worry on Selection Sunday, I think they need to get nine more wins. So whether that's nine more conference wins and gets them to 12 and six, or whether that's eight more conference wins and a win against Iowa State that gets them to 11 and seven with another probably quadrant one win or close to quadrant one win, I think they're they're sitting pretty at that point. But, um, you know, you and I, you and I have covered Ole Miss basketball for a long time, like. I, people, it's not how they start, man. Like I've seen, I've seen good starts. I've seen okay starts. I've seen bad starts, good finishes. Like this isn't the day and age where, I mean, pretty sure, I'm pretty sure Rod, Rod got in one year at eight and eight in league play. And it's just so metric driven right now. Like you, you can't, you can't think you're going to go 500 and get in. Now, last year, teams did go 500 to get in. In fact, LSG, eh, someone might have gotten 8 and 10 and gotten in, but they played a much more demanding at a conference schedule. And Ole Miss is obviously scheduled significantly better. But I just think to feel safe on Selection Sunday, they've got to get into that 23 win range with either 11 conference wins and another at a conference win against Iowa State or that, that 12 conference win range. Yeah, it's that deal where you might get in, but I do think that either Nashville could matter or 11 and 7 with a loss to Iowa State, if nothing else, makes you feel a little bit bubbly on that uh, on that day. And I mean, to me, this whole thing rides on the health of Devontae Shuler. I mean, Neil and I discussed it a good bit on Wednesday. If he's out for any length of time, this this puts them in a really, really, really hard spot. Frankly, no matter who they're playing on the other side. So this this thing might even be health-driven on whether they make a serious run at the tournament or not. Oh, for sure. I mean, you look at them. This, let's not act like this is a flawless basketball team. I mean, you saw on Monday night where they really struggled. They do not have a difference-making big man. And because of that, oftentimes their best players are guards. And so a lot of times you see them, they have to go four guards with one big and you saw it with the LSU game. They just got absolutely killed by LSU's size, whether it was rebounding, whether it was length in the passing lanes and whatnot. And, and you see you see the types of teams that can make them struggle. And it's, it's any team with some size and length because uh, especially if your guards weren't making shots, you can't, you can't really do anything against that. They're pretty defenseless. Yeah, no, I mean, it's that deal where Ole Miss has two flaws, and they're going to come out at some point over a 30-game schedule, and that's lack of depth and lack of inside presence, and both those things rear its head on on Tuesday, and they will again, depending on what's going on. Because, yeah, there's, there is a path for this basketball team, but it's very narrow, and it's one path. There, there's one way that they make this thing happen. They've done a good job of that so far. But they've got a, a very big game against Arkansas on Saturday that they desperately need prior to uh, going to Tuscaloosa on Tuesday. I think it's Tuesday. Tuscaloosa, uh, Alabama coming off a win against Correct. Missouri last night where both those teams played pretty poorly, but nonetheless, yeah. M- Mizzou, Mizzou not exactly filling up to their uh, their side of that, hey, we're going to the SEC to be a basketball power thing. No, and I, like if you think if you look at it on Ken Palm, I think the Alabama game before Tuesday night was, was a slight projected win on the road. Now it's a slight projected loss on the road at 77-76. But, I mean, hey, look at it this way. They're three and one in league play. They have a road win over what's probably going to be a top twenty-five team for most of the year. That's huge. That cannot be that cannot be under you know overstated enough. Road wins against quadrant one opponents are so massive in terms of metrics. And for them at three and one, if you would have given Kermit Davis three and one through the first four, he would have taken that because that either meant it was going to have he was either going to have you know, two wins over Auburn and Mississippi State or Auburn and LSU or Mississippi State and LSU. And I think he would have taken two of the three of either of those. On the other side, Vanderbilt is becoming a uh, disaster. So that is a little that, that Ole Miss really needs that to even just stay a quadrant two. But we'll see kind of where that goes. As, yeah, you uh, just need them to kind of tread water. You need them to win. Yeah. I mean, that's the yeah. thing. Let's, uh, let's switch to football a little bit. So I, I know you and Neil in the beer garden talked a little NFC, AFC uh, title games for Sunday. Somebody asked me this question last night. If you're the Rams or the Saints, or I guess even the Patriots, 
because I think the Chiefs for sure it already is. Is the season already a success? Uh, that's an interesting question because did you see the statistic about no team since the Niners made the Super Bowl? I guess was that 2013? Yeah, every home team has won since 2013 in the conference championship games. Yeah, no. Oh, well, yeah, this was the way that I liked that it was written. No team has played a road playoff game and made the Super Bowl. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Zero road playoff games since the 2014, 15, 16, 17, 18 completed playoffs. No team has played a road game and made the Super Bowl. So, I don't know. I think it's fascinating because the Rams... the Rams blew up what they had last year, like, especially defensively. Like, so can you say, can you say just, you know, getting to this point was worth it? Because I don't think that was the Rams goal. Like, I think the Rams decided at this point, it was all about it's a Super Bowl or bust, even though maybe they not, maybe haven't exactly said it. Um, I think maybe for the Saints, you could perhaps say that it was because it does feel like it does feel like that as great of a year that this was, it was somewhat of a surprise. It felt like coming into the year, the thought was, hey, win the division um, and see how far you can go. But I don't feel like it was, hey, this team is going to be the number one seed, especially after that very first Bucks game. I think there was people ready to hit the panic button. So. Um, and I do think for the Chiefs, there's the idea that, yeah, that it probably is because it's weird how the Chiefs and the Rams both have young quarterbacks, but they feel like two completely different. They feel like they're in two completely different franch or two, two completely different positions as franchises. Well, yeah, it's because of the moves the Rams have made. I, I just saw it because of, and I get it. You can't take anything for granted. Who knows when, when windows close and open. But I saw it the other way, just from the standpoint of the Saints are kind of on their last leg here. I mean, Breeze only doesn't have a whole lot left. They've got to win another one now if they're going to win it, whereas we all think the Rams have a much longer window to get back. I mean, I, even I think my brother kind of has that thought a little bit of, hey, no matter what happens Sunday, the Rams are going to be better for the experience and for uh, just kind of getting to this point in the uh, in the playoffs. What I think is more interesting is, do you have any feel whatsoever for these games? None. Uh, I, frankly, with Rankins out, I think the Rams are the better team. Uh, I think the Saints are really hard to beat in New Orleans. I mean, I, I could coin flip this thing, and I've got a really weird feeling that is not based on talent whatsoever that the Patriots win in Kansas City on Sunday. See, that I'm with you, but it's only based on just they always the do. Patriots. Right, and I believe – they haven't won on the road in the AFC Championship game since 2004. I believe that's right, yeah. So you look at it now, they've lost three straight road AFC Championship games, but all were against Peyton Manning-led teams. So I don't know. Like I, I look at it this way. I don't, think the ch- I don't think the Patriots are going to look as unprepared for misdirection and all of the things that the Chiefs' offense does like the Colts did last Saturday. I don't think there's a bad matchup, but if you're the TV exec, who do you want? See, we've had this debate all here on our show. Jeff is a Bills fan. Calkins is a Bills fan, and he just he's so sick and tired of the Patriots. I still think the most interesting matchup is Saints versus Patriots. He thinks that America is tired of the Patriots. And I would phrase it this way. I'm sure everyone's maybe somewhat tired of the Patriots, but don't you feel like last year was a better Super Bowl because Nick Foles and the Eagles did what they did against the Patriots? Like, I don't think that feels quite as special, and I don't think that's nearly as interesting as if they would have beat the Jacksonville Jaguars with Blake Bortles on the sidelines last year. Well, from an interesting standpoint, I I think that the the, the Saints, the Rams are very interesting. the Patriots, frankly, are very interesting, but I think people tune into the Super Bowl to root against the Patriots. The Patriots are so hated that I think enough people watch simply to pull for the other team, a lot like the Eagles last year. Now, in saying that, the second most hated team in football might be the New Orleans Saints. So I do kind of wonder what the average Joe thinks in a Saints-Patriots matchup in the Super Bowl. 
Yeah, and I think maybe my issue is far too often we don't see like great quarterback matchups in the Super Bowl. And we got to see Breeze versus Manning. And I just selfishly, I want to see before we go. And I know it's not either of them in their prime, but I just want to see Breeze versus Brady. That's fair. Yeah, there's nothing about that. I, I mean, I think I would rather play the Patriots and the Chiefs as a Saints fan. Take a quick break in our talk with Jeffrey to take the podcast brought to you by Community Mortgage, Oxford, Memphis, Soto County, and Chattanooga. All underwriting and processing is done in Memphis. You're getting local underwriting and understands your market. A leader in condo financing in Oxford and the float down option, which allows you to lock in the current rate. But if rates go down before you close, you get that lower rate. 662-234-2704. Or JLO, that's J-L-O-W-E at communitymtg.com. Ole Miss baseball season right around the corner. Season tickets start at just $150. To purchase, visit OleMissTicks.com. The Ole Miss women's hoops team back in action on Sunday afternoon, 3 p.m. They take on the Florida Gators. It's a powder blue out. Tickets can be purchased by visiting OleMissTicks.com. The Ole Miss men's tennis team kicks off their home slate with a doubleheader against North Alabama beginning at 2 p.m. on Saturday. Admission is free. For more information, visit OleMissSports.com. And as we've been mentioning, the Ole Miss men's hoops team looks to defend the pavilion with the matchup versus the Arkansas Razorbacks at noon on Saturday. The first 1,000 fans will receive a free Fins Up t-shirt. Limited tickets can be uh, remain and can be purchased by visiting OleMissTicks.com. This podcast also brought to you by the Weston Jackson. Restore serenity to your soul by visiting Soul Spots, the ultimate luxury spa experience. In downtown Jackson, indulge in personalized massages, signature facials, soothing body treatments, and much more on their extensive spa list. Escape from the everyday, rejuvenate yourself in their luxury spa today, and then gather at Estelle Wine Bar and Bistro, sip on a creative craft cocktail, or enjoy their curated wine list. It's open for breakfast, lunch, dinner, and Sunday brunch. Chef Caden's mission is to connect guests with the community through local partnerships, so gather at Estelle tonight. Now back to Jeffrey Wright. The Chiefs scare I think me a little that's more probably for some reason. Because it feels like when they get going, you can't keep up. Yeah, that's fair. I, I just, so, I, Neil and I had this debate, too. Um, we were on the show on Wednesday. I got the text. If your team's in the Super Bowl, do you go to a Super Bowl party? I never did. I always watched by myself. I didn't even watch with, like, friends. Like, even, like, I just watched by myself. You put yourself in a room by yourself. Yes, I, I couldn't take it around other people. I, yeah, because I, I think once it gets going, it will it would be like last time where you get so involved because it's, hey, we really need to win this thing. Like, all week long, you tell yourself it's just happy to be here, but I think that goes away once the ball's in the air. Oh, there's no question. Like, you can tell yourself it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. You're just happy to be here. <laughs> just don't get blown out. And no, once, once the ball's in the air and then they start – I mean, not to – here's some expert analysis. Like, it is the freaking Super Bowl. Like, whether it's whether it's dumb or not, this, like, defines – this defines, like, what your franchise is. You know what I mean? However, in saying that, I'm always – well, I'm always. It's only been a couple. I'm much more stressed out in the NFC title game than I was in the Super Bowl. The, 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 the conference championship game is the most stressful time for a fan. And see, this is why I completely agree with you. The conference championship game, it's a broadcast thing, I'm convinced. The game is just broadcasted like any other like any other Sunday game. And so because of that, the game is flying by. And because it's flying by, every play feels way, 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 way more intense. And... The way the Super Bowl is broadcasted, you know, you have the commercials. There's, like, the chance to catch your breath. Like, everything slows down half times longer. Uh, it's, it's, I'm convinced it's all about the broadcast. That's probably fair, I guess. So let me ask you this before we move on to college in a second. Say Breeze does win two more games. Say the Saints win the Super Bowl. I'm not jinxing. I'm just talking. Uh, where, do we, where does that put him? What does that do for him? Does that move him ahead or even with Aaron Rodgers? I think it definitely separates him above Ben Roethlisberger. Where are we talking about with Breeze if he wins a second Super Bowl? 
I mean, in my eyes, he's the at the worst, the third greatest quarterback of all time. Oh, really? Yeah. I don't buy into this. The, we are in the age of elite quarterback play, and I don't buy into this uh, back in my day, boy. Now, th- this is the best. The the Brady Manning Breeze era is the best quarterbacks have ever played. You're you not putting any credence per- on the changes nope. in rules or any of those things. No, you look at completion percentage. You look at difficulty of throws. You look at what they're asked to do. Um, you know, I think all it says is look at the day and age when you used to be able to get to the Super Bowl without a elite quarterback. Like that's come and gone. Yeah, Trent Dilfer is not winning a Super Bowl anymore. No. So you've got I mean, Brady, Manning, and Breeze if he wins another one? Yeah. Okay. And I don't, you know, I mean, if you want to shuffle the order in some way. I mean, the truth is, Breeze, and I stand by this firmly, and it's not because uh, of my stature itself. Drew Breeze doesn't look like a quarterback, so therefore, <laughs> because of height supremacy, he's not con- he's not included in the greatest argument of all time. But he is, from every metric, when you look at number of times he's led the league in passing, led the league in touchdown passes, led the league in completion percentage, led the league in completion percentage while also leading the league in yards per attempt. Like every, every metric that we judge a quarterback by, he has a Super Bowl. He's won tons and tons of games. Almost every single metric that we judge a quarterback by, he is. He's the most the accurate passer five. of all time. Yes. Statistically. Yes. Is it also because he doesn't have a name and he plays for the Saints? I think it's less about the Saints because, I mean, for God's sakes, Peyton Manning played for the Colts. I mean, and I get it. He was a Manning, but it's not like Archie Manning's an NFL great. Yeah. And I don't think people – I don't think people in the South recognize, like, a lot of – most NFL fans are so unaware of what's happening in college football. And I guess in some ways the NFL, I mean, being the king, it's almost kind of like the NBA too where – Market size doesn't really matter. Um, I think New Orleans has elevated its stature as high as it possibly can for an NFL franchise. But at the end of the day, if you win games in the NFL, it doesn't really matter how big your city or your media market is. I mean, one of the one of the most storied and respected franchises, I guess maybe not yeah. at the moment, Green is the Bay. Green Bay Packers. Yeah. Like, I mean, it just really doesn't matter. I mean, you know what I mean? I mean, New England and – it's not like Foxborough and Boston are, are are right there. Although number of sports fans that actually realize any geography to that, not many. A, a, a very high percentage of people think that think that stadium's in Boston. Have we ever had a conference championship week where every city has double names? Dylan asked me this the other day, and I just going through in my head. I thought, okay, we need to see who else was in it when Green Bay played New England and then when Green Bay played Kansas City. Those were the two only ones like Super Bowl ones off the top of my head where I thought, oh, I'm kind of curious who else was in those championship games. Ooh, who did – okay, so that was 1997, right? I think it was seven. Now, you know, obviously the Saints don't count because they've only been in the NFC title game twice. And they played Indianapolis in the Super Bowl, so no. And then they played Chicago in the NFC Championship game, so no. Okay, all so right. They don't so, count. so we were close. Green Bay beat San Francisco twenty-three to ten. Oh no, no. So that, that, I'm sorry. That was the that was the ninety-seven, ninety-eight playoffs. Gotcha. Okay, and then that was Denver beat Pittsburgh. Same thing though. Uh, the Green Bay beat Carolina. So no. And then New England beat Jacksonville. Oh, I forgot that was the year the expansion team. It was like the second year they got they both got in. That's right. And then what was the other year we were considering? I, it'd be like Super Bowl one or two. It'd be Green Bay, Kansas City. Uh so sixty six into sixty seven, is that right? I think that was Super Bowl three, wasn't it? The one the Chiefs won. Well, Super Bowl three was Baltimore, wasn't it? No, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, no, no. The, they know what the AFC didn't win till uh, the Jets. Um. Okay. So. All right. 
the Kansas. So this would be the. So the Kansas when Kansas City beat Minnesota. Well, you already know then. When did they start calling it the Super Bowl? I thought it was sixty six, but I don't. Yeah, I don't think it's ever happened. Well, there's something. Uh, that's good stuff. Yeah, that's, that's good a stat stuff. that matters. I mean, here's what it comes down to. For me in the Saints and Rams game, if the Saints are able to run the football, they're probably going – I mean, if the, if the Rams are able to run the football against the Saints, they're probably going to win. Hot take. But they, more than anyone, are so predicated on the play-action deep shot. Like, I don't think it's coincidence. The, the stat that – everyone's been seeing like if the Rams run for more than 120 yards golf is 18 and 0 as a starter and there he's eight and 15 when they don't run for 100 yards but what's fascinating is the Saints haven't allowed a 100 yard rusher since week 11 when P Ryan got like 117 or something like on him but the Cowboys weren't letting anyone run on him either and the Rams did unspeakable things to the Cowboys up front Chase, they were averaging 4.1 yards per carry between the tackles before contact. It's why I think that the Rams are the better team. I think so, but then you can't dismiss the fact that it's like, it's not coincidence that the Saints are 6-0 and at home in the playoffs under Breeze, with, under, with Breeze and, and Peyton. They've never lost one, ever. I just think if I'm a Saints fan, I'm less concerned about, I would be more worried about I think Peyton is coaching like an asshole. Well, he is. And I don't think his team, I think his team is extremely good, but I don't think he's coaching like that team that has the high school team, or he's coaching like the, the high school coach that has the team that's so much better that you can't do anything about it. I mean, how about the new wrinkle? Let's now have Taysom Hill run, let's have him run deep routes. He was wide open, he called it. No, no, no. The one that the one that was incomplete, and then people said, "Well, Breeze under through." It's like oh, you do. Yeah, yeah. You do realize, like receiver, like it is a skill to make a pass look like it's a not overthrown, or b to draw a flag when a ball is underthrown, and he can't do either because he's not a freaking receiver. Uh, by the way, Super Bowl won the runners up were uh, Baltimore and Philadelphia. So no, never happened. Then look up uh, Super Bowl four. Uh, switch real quick because I want to get on this. So, uh, Tosh leaving for the Browns, Alabama losing another coordinator, another coach. We always do this, but one to ten, how big of a problem is this for Alabama in the big scheme of things? Um, six. I put some stock into Paul Feinbaum saying that the Sarkeesian hire reeks of desperation. I really do. Instead of some sort of continuity or whatever? I stress it's it's rumored, but by all accounts, from people that I trust, I think Steve Sarkeesian's drinking again. And good luck. It looks like Butch Jones could be an actual assistant coach on this team next year. I mean, are you telling me that I'm not saying like, oh, Scott, sky is falling. This is the end. This is the end. It's still Saban that matters the most because he's the one getting the players, and that's what matters the most is who has the players. But, I, you know, I put – my antenna was very up when Dan Enos went to go take the Miami job. Yeah, it looked like he was escaping. Yes. And, I mean, duh, who's going to win more or anything? So, why are you going? I mean, and, and, and I get that it, it does take a toll on you personally if you're not in Saban's kind of main little group. I understand that. But then, at the end of the day, this type of turnover means something else is up. Right. And if you're Enos, the odds are overwhelming that – because unlike some of the other guys that have had the offensive coordinator position, like Enos doesn't, Enos doesn't have baggage. If he would have done that job for – a year, maybe, maybe two, he's going to get another head coaching gig. Well, even look at Tosh yesterday. I mean, it, that's not even a lateral move. Isn't that a step down, what he actually took? Which gives more credence to the idea that 
Tosh wasn't really running the defense from the middle of the year on. And especially on game days, I think it's been pretty well documented. Golding was handling everything actually during games. So that might have just been a, hey, get me out of here. But a guy that does it, is not known as a coach, is known as a recruiter, suddenly goes to a place where he's definitely not recruiting and he's going to struggle as a coach? I mean, I, I agree with you. Going from a defensive coordinator to a defensive line coach, even if it is up in the NFL, like that's considered a step down. Like when, you know, didn't Orgeron get fired and isn't that the, first, the only gig he was offered, a defensive line job yeah, for the NFL the Saints. With the Saints? Yeah, that's what the Saints. Did he coach that whole season? I think so, yeah. I remember going to training camp because it was at uh, Millsaps. And the first time I saw him was when they were doing the the the, the fall camp stuff at Millsaps prior to the season. What uh, I saw some stuff yesterday. I got you for like a minute left. What's uh, what's up with Barnes and Penny? It looks like they're going to get along real well in uh, Tennessee these days. Uh, I kind of like it. Now, it's bold by Penny to take on like one of the the most respected coaches probably in the entire profession in the the fashion that he is. But like I'm all for it here because it is. There's nothing quite like when you get a uh, real chip on the shoulder Memphis. And now that Tennessee's back to kind of being the establishment, like it makes for entertainment. Like, I'm glad that I'm not involved in it one way or the other. And I'm just sitting here as kind of the ringmaster. I enjoy that, but it's, uh, it's bold by Penny. But is it really, it only benefits him. I mean, what, what's the right. down? What's no, the it's, what's, it's, what's the downside for no, Penny? Like, people get mad at me when I say this, but like, it's very similar to like when Trump fires off a tweet. Like, he's not talking to the nation when he fires off a tweet. He's talking to his base. Like, Penny is the head coach of the University of Memphis. Like, he's not the head coach of basketball fans at large. Like, and it fires up his fan base, and they are loving it, and they're eating it up. And so, m- most people are probably looking at it and rolling their eyes like when they see like all the social media stuff, but like his people are eating it up. And the other flip side of it is Chris are eating it up. So I don't, I don't, you know what I mean? Like would I probably run my program like that? No, but <laughs> I don't, I probably wouldn't also be getting James Wiseman. Well, it depends where you are on the flip side. It almost benefits Rick Barnes more to just kind of shut up and go about his, his day. So it, it really, he doesn't need to take Penny on. Yes. And so I don't know, like, I just think it's just fascinating to watch because it's it's pretty theatrical right now. Fair enough. Have a good day, Jeff. Talk to you soon. All right. Thanks to Jeffrey, as always, for joining us. The podcast also brought to you by Mastercuts Lawn and Landscape 662-607-7773. Mastercutslawn.com. Set up a free quote with them or just let them come out and see what they can do for you over the course of the year. Sign that contract take care of lawn, landscaping, pine straw, flower beds, whatever you need. Mastercuts will handle it. Send them an email at info at gomastercuts.com. Remember, they're still doing the custom playhouses and much, much more. Now is the time before it warms up and you'll need someone to take care of your lawn. Again, 662-607-7773. Podcast also brought to you in part by John Edwards of Regency Travel Incorporated in Memphis. We've told you how to do this for a while. You call John, you tell him what you're looking to do. Give him some parameters, give him some ideas, give him a time frame, a budget, and man, he'll do the rest. Um, he's part of Virtuoso. It's a worldwide network of travel partners that allows John to supply his clients with added values and unique benefits that are simply not available to other travelers. So no matter what it is that you're looking to do, heading to Europe for golf or for a, uh, a honeymoon, a uh, an anniversary, um, a, a summer trip with the family, whatever it is, get in touch touch with John, give him some, give him some parameters. He'll bring you options that you would not find on your own. 901-494-3387 or send him an email, Edwards at regencytravel.net. First time clients can save $50 off their first booked trip just by telling John you heard about Regency Travel on the podcast. We're also brought to you by Grenada Nissan. If you're in the market for a Nissan vehicle, Grenada Nissan's the place to go. They have a complete selection of new and previously owned Nissan vehicles. If they don't have it, uh, they'll, they'll get it in their inventory 
very quickly just for you. Their service is fantastic. It's it's fantastic before the sale, and it's fantastic after the sale. It's GrenadaNissanUSA.com. Podcast also brought to you by Harry Alexander. Harry's an Oxford-based Remax Legacy Realty agent. He's been in Oxford more than four decades. No one knows the residential and condo market in Oxford better than Harry. Go to his site. He'll prove it to you. It's HarryAlexander.com. Click on the Properties and Neighborhoods tab, filter through about what you're looking for, then send him an email. It's ha at HarryAlexander.com. And we're brought to you by Oxford University Bank, OUB, locally owned and operated right here in Oxford. When you deposit money at OUB, that money and the vast majority of the bank's profits go right back into the Oxford community. OUB gives you the comfort of home, all the benefits the big mega banks provide, all, all the technology and products you can want, all with the personal touch. OUB also offers its customers the absolute best cash checking account. It's called Casasa. And with Casasa, OUB will pay customers 2.5% interest on their balances, up to $50,000. And with Casasa, ATM fees nationwide are refunded. OUB also offers online bill pay and mobile check deposit using its online app. To learn more about OUB, check out liveoxfordbankoxford.com or call 662-234-6668. OUB is FDIC insured. Pop up Oxford just one day away, January 19th through 27th. Ole Miss basketball, community reading, songwriter competitions. Again, so many different things, including hotel hop, MLK service day, book signings, the Oxford art crawl, the veteran bites, cocktail class and tastings, and much, much more. It's Dr. Mountain Radio participating January 24th. See the full calendar of events at popupoxfordms.com and see what all is going on in Oxford. Visit oxfordms.com slash events. little update, Neil. Actually, tomorrow's game sold out for uh, Arkansas. Second straight sellout, sixth in pavilion history. So, well, there you go. There you I go. did not. I was not aware. Yeah, it was in the uh, the media release sent out uh, this morning at 8 a.m. that I just happened wow. to click on for some reason. So One that I cut and paste and just put on the site without reading it. There you go. Good job. Uh, in yeah. their defense, it was in the headline. The held the headline is sold out Saturday at the at the pavilion. Like I said, it was just a cut and paste. It was, yes. Just say. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, Arkansas seventy six in the net. Uh, pretty uneven schedule to this point. They they played pretty, pretty well in most of their losses, but they uh, they have lost six games. They lost a uh, neutral site. Well, really at Texas, but sort of neutral site game in Texas. Um, they lose a home game to Western Kentucky, who's eight and nine and one nineteen in the net. They lose to Georgia Tech at home in in uh, Bud Walton, and then after beating Texas A and M on the road at Reed Arena, they lose three straight SEC games. They lose at home to Florida, at home to LSU in overtime, and then get blown out in Knoxville, which no one is holding that against them. But this is just a uh, just a huge game, really, Neil. Before uh, a little bit of a stretch, it's interesting for them that if they found a way tomorrow. They could find some breathing room, at least get some oxygen back in their uh, proverbial system because they have Missouri at home next and then uh, also Georgia at home, which should be two wins for the Hawks. Yeah, listen, I watched a good bit of the second half of Arkansas LSU last Saturday. We all saw LSU on Tuesday night. We know how good they are. Arkansas took that team to overtime. Arkansas took that team to overtime. The people that look at this on the schedule and go, well, they're one and three. This should be a win. It's going to be a difficult game to win. And I think Ole Miss can win it. But um, they'll have to play really well. They'll have to shoot well. They'll have to be efficient on offense again. Arkansas presents problems in the in the low post because of uh, of Gafford. He's a, he's a shot blocker. He's a presence at the rim. He's a lottery pick. He's an athletic big man who can do a lot of things. He's going to play in the NBA. Um, he, he's he's a problem for Ole Miss. They they cannot let him establish himself and get a lot of easy buckets and then go kill them on the boards. And they've got to attack the glass. They can't get intimidated of his presence. He's going to get some blocks, but you still have to come at him. That's what LSU did. They just kept coming at him, kind of wore them down a little bit. Ole Miss will have to do the same thing. This is going to be a very difficult game to win. I don't know what the line is. I don't know if the line's out yet, but um, I'm sure Ken Palm has Ole Miss winning this game, but I'm telling you this is going to be a really close game. Uh, Tyree has to play well. Davis has to play well. Henson has to play well. He, he, he's he got to calm down and just go play basketball. 
Um, they're, they're going to have to play well to win this game. Arkansas is hungry. They're better than their record indicates. Um, and, and they present that low post problem for Ole Miss that teams that have athletic uh, bigs, not just big dudes, but super athletic bigs are going to be handfuls for Ole Miss. Now, they've handled it a couple times against Mississippi State, against Auburn. Um, they did not particularly handle it all that well against LSU. And, and then individually, Gafford might be the best big man in the league. Now, they don't have the depth across the front that some of the other teams they've played have, but they'll have their hands full tomorrow. Yep, Ken Palm is projecting an 80-73 to 73 Ole Miss win tomorrow. Yeah, and if you made me pick, I'd pick Ole Miss by three or four points. I think it's really close. Uh, if you told me tomorrow that Ole Miss won by seven, I'd say, wow. Um, you know, but but I think it's a close game. I think it's I think it's a big game, and, and it, it's good for Ole Miss that it's packed and the fans are going to be there and all that stuff. Um, they, the, they, need, they need that. They just have to corral that enthusiasm. I thought and, – and look, they came out of the gate playing well the other day, except offensively they weren't efficient. Had they been, they might have built a double-digit lead in the first half and, and been able to sort of withstand some of what happened. But they've got to play a little more composed offensively out of the gate. Hit some buckets, run offense, do your thing. They need to send a message to Arkansas because Arkansas is looking at this and going, "We can. this is one we can get. And uh, um, they got to send a message early that this is going to be a long day. See if a team that's one in three in the league that's probably has a little doubt creeping into the back of their minds. See if you can get some of that doubt to manifest itself early. Yeah, I was. I mentioned earlier, I, I did a, a radio spot out of the ESPN radio thing in Fort Smith this, this morning. And I've done this show a few times. Guys are all right. But Mike Anderson, pretty much all they wanted to talk about, which I was not the guest for that discussion, but I was game enough and sort of participated from a I, – I gave them a very casual view of it, which I probably could pull off. But Twitter has kind of blown up, too, since then with Arkansas fans talking back and forth. He is uh, – just from an outside sort of – you know, they've been to the tournament, but he sort of treaded the water, too, especially what their relative expectations are. And it does feel like that if he does not significantly turn this thing around, it's either going to be over or it is going to be complete mutiny in uh, Northwest Arkansas. Look, the expectation there, whether it's realistic or not, the expectation there is to be a perennial sweet 16 sort of program. Yes. Make the tournament, win a game, sometimes win the second game, get to the second weekend. That's that expectation. They're what 20 some odd years removed from, winning a title and playing for a title and being a dominant SEC program. And they're not one anymore. Yeah, 24 years, 1994. Yeah. I mean, it's, 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 they're not one anymore yet. That's still the expectation. Um, I don't know whether, I don't know what all the dynamics are on that, but it gets harder and harder for them to, uh, I mean, think about just kind of the dynamics of their program. I mean, you, you, you're expected to dominate inside the state of Arkansas in recruiting, and they haven't in a long time. They're expected to pluck players out of Memphis. It's going to be harder and harder for them to do that because of Penny Hardaway. Um, you know, it, frankly, it's it's going to be very difficult for Mike Anderson or anyone else to live up to those expectations. There was a while that that Bud Walton Arena, which is a nice arena, was almost like a palace. Well, it's not a palace anymore. It's, it's getting older. Other people. People have built arenas. I've never been convinced that a kid's going to go play just to play in an arena. Um, it's going to be hard. I, I I think Mike is in trouble if he can't make the tournament this year. I, I'll be honest. I, I don't. If that team doesn't go to the t tournament with a uh, a lottery pick at at center, there's going to be unrest there. What do you mean? Do you think they're a tournament team? Uh, today, no. Now, you know, Gabbert's good enough that – Gafford, I mean, is good enough for them to, to go on a run. They they took LSU to overtime. They they played okay on the offensive end against Tennessee. Um, they, they're talented enough to, to win some games and get on a run, sure. But they're going to start. They've, they've got to got to go to places like Ole Miss and win, especially if Ole Miss is playing with a, a, a handicapped – 
point guard. Those are games you have to win. I mean, you can't start one and four in this league and say, hey, we're going to go make the tournament. They, they've they got to – you mentioned their schedule. Their schedule gives them an opportunity, but it starts with the win at Ole Miss. If, if they lose to Ole Miss, the schedule doesn't really matter. They've also got a pretty tough assignment there in the SEC Big 12 Challenge. They have to go to Lubbock and play Texas Tech. I overlooked that one while I was looking through the, uh, the games there. Um, yeah, that's a tough one. Iowa State went to Texas Tech and won the other night. Saw that. Ole Miss gets Iowa State in uh, about eight days from now. Yeah, eight days from now. So next yeah. Saturday in Oxford. A um, little football thing here, just kind of fun more than anything else. Jeffrey and I talked a bit about the Alabama coaching staff turnover on Thursday. Uh, Bruce Feldman of The Athletic reported that Dan Enos left for Miami before Saban had even realized he was leaving. His story uh, here, quoting, quote, where the blank is Dan from Saban. Several of the staffers knew the answer to the boss's question. Word had already spread that 50-year-old Enos was headed to Miami to become offensive coordinator and quarterback's coach under Manny Diaz. No one in the room wanted to be the one to break the news to Saban, even though Miami was primed to announce it in a couple hours. One staffer later scrambled to check if Enos was in his office. It was empty, save for a pencil on the desk. Maybe he'd already moved into Loxley's old office, but that one was empty, too. He moved out like the Colts, which had one person with knowledge of the matter, equating Enos' departure to the middle-of-the-night exit by the old Baltimore NFL franchise to Indianapolis. Well, I saw where Enos, Enos denied it. He said that he that it wasn't like that, but he said business is business. It probably is exactly like it's described in the Feldman article, by the way. I, I believe Feldman. Um. I, the, I don't want to expose kind of where I'm getting this because it's, I ah, screw it. Um, when we covered defensive coordinator search when it started, when there was a lot of talk about, uh, uh, you know, Peaking. Ole Miss going, yeah, Ole Miss going after him. One of the things that we heard out of out of there, and not just specifically about about him, but about a number of guys on that staff, is it's not family friendly. Saban just kills guys. It's a miserable pl- place to work. It looks great on your resume after it's done. You, you, you coach great players, all that stuff. It, it's ultimately good for your career, but it's really hard on your life. And I think what you're starting to see is more of these guys go, all right, I've been here. I got to get out. It's miserable. Um, and Saban's getting older, and as he gets older, I don't think he's changed much. Uh, so much of I thought one of the more, more interesting things in there was for the players. There's whether it's Cochran or uh, the, the one of the trainer guys. I can't think of his name. They have guys that play good cop at Alabama that the players can go to, and you know the the that that. Cochran or whoever can say, "Hey, just ignore it. Come on, you, you you know you know you're good." Blah blah blah, and they don't really deal. The players don't really deal with Saban as much as they deal with other people, strength and conditioning and stuff like that. So it's easier for them to sort of deal with it in small doses. If you're one of his coaches, um, you deal with it every day, and so much of his tantrums and such, like I thought this was interesting, are almost programmed. Third day of camp, I'm going to say this. Uh, the week of of between the the rivalry games, uh, I'm going to act this way. I'm going to do all these things. Some of the media who cover them have noticed it and have kind of talked about it. And now you find out that it's happening inside coaches meetings and stuff. That so much of it is 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 drama that's generated by Saban because I guess he thinks it works or it makes him comfortable or whatever the case may be. And I just think his guys. People change. That that stuff doesn't work much. I mean, a young guy can't show up and decide he's going to start treating people like a Nick Saban, and expect it just to people just to take it. It's one of the one of the reasons that a lot of people are uh, wanting to work for Matt Luke, frankly. And and the people that take this and go, well, you know, you have to be a hard ass. No, you don't. You do, you absolutely don't have to be a hard ass. You've got to be you've got to be a, a, accountable and all those things, but. Um, I, I don't know how many coaches really want to subject their families to what it's like coaching for Saban. After a while, it's just not worth it. Kids aren't welcome in the facility, from what I hear. Uh, um, 
you 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 work from 6 a.m. to 10 or 11 p.m. You don't see your families. That's it's a lot to ask. And then he's on your ass at all times. I just think at some point that, that stuff gets old. And Dan Eno said, I'm out. And basically just got the hell out. I, I don't doubt for a minute that he went in there in the middle of the night and packed his stuff and got out of there. And frankly, I don't blame him. Like I saw where Barrett Salee, and I love Barrett, said that that's cowardly or whatever he said. I disagree. You want to leave? Leave. You don't think no. you should tell the guy you're leaving? Um. Oh come on! You got to tell know, the guy that, you're leaving, even if you send him a post-it happen? note. I don't. Well, that that's irrelevant. Send him a post-it note. Just make sure he knows you're out of the building. Is my point. Carrier pigeon. I don't care. I find it difficult. I find it difficult to believe that Nick Saban had absolutely no knowledge. Well, I, no, I don't Enos. doubt that. I think he knew Enos was gone. I don't think Enos personally told him he was leaving. Yeah, may not have. Or either representation of Enos told him he was leaving. I don't know how that works either, but you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. I, I just, I find it, I find it, frankly, knowing what I know about some of the dynamics of some of that, I find it absolutely impossible to believe that Nick Saban walked into that meeting having no idea that Dan Enos was was leaving for the University of Miami. I, I, I find that impossible to believe. So it, again, it's 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 Saban and an acting job. Yeah, it's Saban acting a certain way because that's become his persona. Last time uh, we're on air prior to Sunday, what's your uh, picks for the Super Bowl? Um, I like the Bears in the NFC title game. Gotcha. Okay. And uh, I, I just hope the AFC game goes multiple overtimes so that we can get them. Into, I, no, I, I like Saints. Saints. Chiefs, I think. I like Saints for sure in the NFC. I'm not sure whether I'm just picking against the Patriots because I'm tired of them or whether I think Patrick Mahomes is going to be too much for New England. I think that AFC game has classic written all over it. Uh, I, I'm going to stick with the Chiefs. And I think, the, I think the Saints win by more than a touchdown. I think the AFC game is is – Really close. I'm really curious you? to see Mahomes on Sunday, how he kind of handles it. Something about – I told you, it's been this way all week. I said this. People's already heard it with Jeffrey. I just think the Patriots win the game. I don't really have a reason for it. Just for some reason, I feel like they find a way on Sunday to win that football game. Typically well, because they usually the, do. You pick the Patriots for the same reason they just – always pick Alabama not you just anybody yeah. you general because they, they, they do it every year I mean the Patriots have been in what is it it's like what is the, the number of AFC title games they've been in it's some incredible number yeah now over they, the last now they have lost four, the last three in a row on the road yeah because that was that stat um, that you obviously weren't on for Jeffrey and I discussed it no road team has won in the conference championship since 2013 put a different way no team has that's had to play a road game in the in, in the playoffs has been to a Super Bowl since 2013. Is that the Giants? Uh, that would have been 49ers, I think. 49ers Ravens okay. year maybe. Yeah, I mean it's it's uh it's it's why those two New York Giants Super Bowls are so incredible. They they won the entire damn playoffs on the road. Um. It's just so hard to win a road playoff game. Uh, obviously, you know, the the Patriots. If there's a team that if there's a team that can do it, New England's the one I'd pick. But they've not done it either. Um, so like you said, so I like the Chiefs. I think they're really good. I think they're playing at a high level right now. They're as healthy as they've been all season. They're just a lot more explosive than, than New England. They're going to have home field. Um, for whatever reason, I think Mahomes is a different cat. I, I just don't think he's going to be bothered by it. I think he's going to play well. But I, if, but if you told me New England won, I'd be shocked. If you told me the Rams won, I mean, if you told me New England won, I wouldn't be shocked. If you told me the Rams won, I'd be kind of shocked. See, I think with Rankins out and the physicality of that run game, I'm not sure the Rams aren't the better team Sunday. I just don't know that the Rams can stop Drew Brees. 
especially at home, and that crowd's going to get going. And I'm not. If they stop them, it's because they do. I mean, they haven't played very well, but they have two elite corners in Saliba and Peters, and their pressure comes up the middle with Donald and Sue and those guys, and that's what irritates Breeze the way he has to kind of move out of the pocket. He handles the outside rush a lot better than he handles that inside rush. So I'm worried about the guard center guard getting overtaken by Donald all day and just kind of creating issues in the passing lanes for Breeze on Sunday. That's my problem. Yeah, it'll be, yeah, and that's what's going to be interesting is Peyton's known this all week, so he's they they they'll have a hell of a plan in place. It yeah. it should be a really good game. The first one was as entertaining, probably not for you, but for a guy like me who didn't care who won really. It was as entertaining an NFL game as I'd seen in a long time. And I, I, I expect more of the same. I, I just, the way Drew Brees has played this year, I, I cannot bet against he and Sean Payton at home. Yeah, They've never lost a home playoff game together. So we'll uh, see on Sunday. We'll be back on Monday to talk to you, I'm assuming. Um, and then plenty at rebelgrove.com. Yep. Have basketball coverage tomorrow from the Pavilion. Have some stuff later today as well. So stay locked in Rebel Grove. We'll talk to you again on Monday.